Welcome everyone to the MASC webinar on state legislative priorities. Today's program is designed for all of our members who want to learn about our legislative priorities and to pick up some valuable tips on how to advocate for them. I'm Pat Francomano, member of the King Philip Regional School Committee and also president of the Mass Association of School Committees. With me today is Jake Oliveira from the Ludlow School Committee, who is MASC's president-elect. Every year our members come to Boston to the State House for our Day on the Hill program. It's a day of learning and a day for advocacy. This year it takes place on Wednesday, April 29th. You can go to our website, masc.org, for additional information, but we will also be showing you some of the information that's, that's there as well. On the morning of the 29th, we will be rolling out our legislative priorities and invite key public policy makers to give us some insight on the legislative year. We have several terrific resources that I referenced earlier, and Jake Oliveira will explain them at this point. Jake? Well, thank you, Pat. And as Pat mentioned, uh, there are several resources that are available on MASC's website, masc.org. Um, the first uh, item that I'd like to present to you is actually our public policy priority sheet that is over here. This is, includes each one of our priority items. It details some talking points about each one of those issues that we discussed, and it's available on our website, but it will also be available on the 29th for Day on the Hill. Also, uh, for your uh, advocacy toolbox, we will include a guide to lobbying that will discuss some of the communication tactics that we use when we're up on Beacon Hill, but it's also a guide and a resource that you may use when you're speaking to legislators within your communities as well. And another item that's backed by popular demand are our flashcards that we introduced last year that describe each of our priorities, whether they're budget priorities, legislative priorities, and it also includes on there the uh, brief explanation and talking points on the back for you to utilize. These were extremely popular with legislators last year and with members of MESC, and we will have copies of these documents for you to use at Day on the Hill. The last document that's available on our website and will be available for Day on the Hill is a list of legislators, their offices, their room numbers, their contact information, including their email address and their phone number. We encourage you to contact your legislator prior to Day on the Hill on the 29th to schedule a meeting. But of course, advocacy doesn't begin and end uh, with Day on the Hill and our advocacy on Beacon Hill. It also uh, takes place each day within our communities. We encourage you to meet with your legislators on a regular basis within your district, give them a tour of your schools, and show them the issues that are impacting education right in your communities. Now I'll turn it back over to Pat Francomano to describe the three categories of our priorities. Thank you, Jake. And I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate you on your election to the National School Boards Association of Directors. Thanks, Pat. Our priorities are divided into three categories. The first one is to improve outcomes for students. The second is to improve funding. The third is to promote reforms that require legislative action. For instance, charter school reform. The first area I'd like to speak about is support for early childhood education. We are looking for increased access to pre-kindergarten programs, affordability of programs, assurances that the programs will bring both quality content and professional staff, as well as continued support for kindergarten programs. These are essential programs for student achievement, especially for some of our more vulnerable students. The second issue that I'd like to bring up is the Children's Services Safety Net. I think we all know when we're in our communities that it's not just the quality of education that's provided to our students, but it's those wraparound services that are important to them and their families to ensure their success. We all know we only have our students six to seven hours of school day. It's important that the services that uh, they rely on day in and day out are funded, are fully funded and provided for. These include physical and mental health issues, family services, the juvenile justice system, and social service agencies that support our students and their families so they in turn can uh, thrive in their educational experience. Our third priority is supporting mobile transient and migrant students. 
this is a growing number of, of students that are uh, really in need of special services. We are talking about students who are members of families that may move three to five times per year. Uh, continues to grow, and these students are often at high risk due to other factors such as homelessness, low income, or ELL. Additional resources are necessary to address these students' needs. And I think it's also important to point out, Pat, that one out of every six students in Massachusetts lives below the poverty line. And in fact, nearly over a third of our students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Each one of these three priorities are essential to helping our students um, and their families cope with the circumstances that are out of the school's control. So we are hoping, and through our advocacy, that the legislature will begin and take these issues very seriously. And please understand that even though some of these issues may not impact your district directly, they are important for all students. And we are for public education for all students, and we need to make sure that we are supporting our fellow districts when it, when it comes to these issues. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back. Go. And we're back to talk about some of the money issues that are impacting all of our school districts. Uh, within the FY16 budget proposal that was proposed by Governor Baker back in February, he called for a $25 increase as a minimum, or $20 per increase per student to the Chapter 70 uh, funding line. Uh, the House Ways and Means Committee that released their budget just last week and will be debating uh, while we'll be at uh, the State House on the 29th call for a $25 increase per minimum. We all understand that Chapter 70 funding is the lifeblood to all of our school districts. It's the import it provides the important resources that our districts need in order to provide a quality education. Each year we are advocating for at least a minimum of a $100 increase within this line item. I think legislators understand, but we need to make the case to them that this line item is about 20% underfunded from where it should be in order to meet the needs of our students. It's estimated that we'd ideally like an additional $3 billion in this line item in order to cover the cost of education to our students. But at this point in time, $3 billion is a bit realistic. It's important to make the case to our legislators that this increase to this line item is essential pro to providing the services we need for our districts to operate. Thank you. Uh, Jake, I, I think one of the other issues that we have to deal with is the area of yet another unfunded area, I suppose, uh, a special education circuit breaker. We need to have the legislature fully fund circuit breaker reimbursement. Circuit breaker is not unlike an insurance policy that handles, that, that helps out districts, if you will, where the cost is in excess of $41,000 $41, by providing 75% of the cost of those services. Unfortunately, that circuit breaker money has not been fully funded. It benefits every district because special education impacts every student. Sped costs continue to grow faster than the rate of inflation. Circuit Breaker prevents cuts to other programs that benefit all students. And finally, since special education is important to every city, town, and region, every district benefits, every district benefits when the Circuit Breaker account is increased, as does the municipal side. Another underfunded area is regarding charter school uh, reform funding. And right now, the charter school reimbursement rate for our school districts, the line item account is intended to cover the full cost of the first year of a student that's placed out of the district to a charter school. And then for the next four years, the Commonwealth will provide 25% of the cost to attend that charter school and reimburse the districts for that funding. Unfortunately, the charter school reimbursement line item has been underfunded severely for several years. It's important that the legislature fully fund this line item in order to provide the resources that our districts need to service the students that are housed within district after students move on to a charter school. Now, regional transportation, similar, similar to Circuit Breaker, was cut by the governor with nine, uh, 
by the governor with nine C cuts in the in the fall and is underfunded in the current in the current governor's budget. Regional transportation is essential for regional schools. It should be funded at 100 percent, not 70 percent, as it currently exists. Thank you, and we'll take a brief break. I just wasn't getting that from program. Finally, we need to increase funding for the METCO program. The METCO program supports the cost of inner city students who may enroll in participating suburban district schools. It's one of the oldest and most successful programs in the Commonwealth to help children at risk. We urge increased funding for FY16 to a level of $19.6 million to adequately support the cost of the METCO program. It has been minimally funded for years. At the current reimbursement rates, it is a dis almost a disincentive for districts to participate. And for a modest investment, the METCO program provides students with opportunities that have demonstrated significant success for these students at risk. And now moving away from our budget priorities and moving to pieces of legislation that require special legislative action in order to help our school districts, the first priority is something I think we can all relate to, and that's curtailing some of the over-regulation and abuse by the state and federal government. If you ask any teacher, any school administrator, any principal, any superintendent, the amount of paperwork that's increased over the past few years and has burdened their job to provide a quality education to our students, they will mention all of the, all of the regulatory issues that are impacting our local school districts. We ask that the legislature and the Governor Act swiftly to make sure that we curtail some of these regulations. We're pleased to find out that Governor Baker and his administration is looking at identifying and eliminating some of the duplicative regulatory items on the municipal side of the equation. We also would urge the administration and the legislature to extend that curtailing of those regulations to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and also to a lot of the areas that impact our school districts. Our superintendents right now are facing each year 108 reporting timetables that they need to report back to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's hindering the job that our teachers are, are doing in the classroom. It's hindering our administrators' ability to appropriately run their buildings, and it's also preventing and stifling some of the innovation that could take place within our school districts. Charter school reform is high on our priority list as well. We need to require charter schools to recruit and retain representative cross-sections of students who are special needs, English language learners, and economically and socially at risk. Additionally, we need to ask legislators to adjust charter school reimbursement to more accurately reflect the level of services provided to clients of special education programs. Charter schools do not recruit, enroll, or retain a representative cross-section of communities from which they seek their students. Charter schools receive greater funding from the foundation budget, budget for, assured, for assumed in school special education than they would otherwise receive based upon the students they actually serve. Communities can be devastated by the loss of state aid when, unwanted, when an unwanted charter school program comes into their, into their district. Additionally, we need to require that new charter schools be approved by the communities from which they take students. This is about local participation. This is about local control. These students, these schools, are in your district, but yet they are free of any oversight at the local level. Our fourth priority is support for small and regional school districts. Uh, coming from Western Mass, this is a very personal item for, for myself. In Western Massachusetts and several regions in the Commonwealth, we have many school districts that service under 1,000 students right now. Many of those school districts are rural in nature and are facing several issues that a lot of our suburban and urban school districts do not face. 
One thing that we can do to support our small and rural school districts is to make sure that they have the self-determining tools for, for them and their communities. It's important to prevent any type of consolidation by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and leave it up to the districts and give them the flexibility so they may improve their regional and rural school districts. A few years ago, DESE tried to give itself the authority to try to regionalize some of these school districts and consolidate them. MESC stood with our rural and um, small school districts and uh, prevented the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education from forcing a consolidation upon them. MESC is proud to work with several partners, especially in the Berkshires right now, to identify some of the challenges that are impacting these school districts and to provide some of the resources they need in order to improve themselves over time. But at the core of all of these issues is the ability for those school districts to self-govern. If they would like to regionalize, if they would like to consolidate, it should be up to the local school districts, not to bureaucrats in Malden to make that determination. Absolutely. Way back when, when education reform went into effect, the school committees would, had the obligation, the right, to approve school improvement plans. Due to a technical change and a technical amendment to the statute, that was taken away. We need that right to be restored to school committees. They should be approving school improvement plans. A school improvement plan is an essential tool to measure the effectiveness of school leadership and student learning and to ensure alignment of district vision and goals at all levels. Without a public discussion and review of a school improvement plan, the, schools com the school committee loses an important governance tool. While we wait for this legislation to move through and while we continue to advocate for it, it's important to remember that you should be including the school improvement plan as part of the assessment, the evaluation process of your superintendent. And finally, the last two priorities deal with the special services that are provided our, to our students within our schools. As many of you know, students that are covered by Medicaid are often serviced within our schools by our school nurses. Right now, when the school district receive, provides these services to the students, that reimbursement will be processed by the federal government, and the communities right now, not the school districts, will receive that reimbursement rate right through Medicaid. We are asking that the legislature change this to allow the district to retain 100% of the reimbursement rate from the federal government in this Medicaid account that provides the services. The school districts are providing the services, however, the communities, not the school districts, are receiving the funding. We're asking the legislature to change that, that uh, legislation to make sure that school districts retain that Medicaid reimbursement. And lastly, on the same lines of health care, Many students that are provided uh, health care through private insurers also get serviced by our school nurses and are serviced in other areas within our schools. It's important that these private insurers also get billed for these services and the district retains that reimbursement rate from private insurers just like they should for Medicaid reimbursements. Thank you, Jake. When we go to the Hill, on May 29th. We hope that you will all be there to join us. Keep a, please keep a couple of things in mind. When you're speaking with your legislator, please understand that he or she may have been confronted with over 150 possible issues on any given day, from banking to farms to education. Uh, they cannot possibly be experts on everything. That's what they rely on you for. It's imperative that when you speak with your legislators that you provide them with examples of your concerns. Exactly how do those overreaching regulations that Jake referred to impact your district on a day-to-day -day basis, both in terms of productivity as well as from a budgetary standpoint. Talk to them about how valuable the special education circuit breaker is to you and how full funding 
of circuit breaker will make your district better and what you would be spending the money on. They thrive, if you will, on examples that they can use. That helps them understand the impact on their local communities, specifically their local voters. Understand also that they have very limited time, so try to be as productive as you can. Try to get all your issues out there. Try to be respectful of their time. And we hope to see you on May 29th. Yep. And just as we mentioned earlier, Pat, one area in which you can be helpful is not just advocating a day on the Hill, but also every day within your communities. If you see a legislator at a grocery store, at a community event, invite them to your schools. Show them the great work that's going on within our public school districts in the Commonwealth, because advocacy doesn't start and end with day on the Hill. It's a constant, constant tool that you need to use each and every day when you're in your communities. The MASC staff and the Board of Directors of MASC can be served as a resource in anything that you need leading up to uh, Day on the Hill, but also feel free to contact us at any time if you have any questions about our legislative priorities or any questions about tactics and approaching legislators. The MASC staff is reachable day and night. Feel free to visit our website, masc.org, to find a full staff listing that includes contact information email addresses and phone numbers, and we'd be happy to chat with you or go out into your school district and discuss, and discuss these issues in person. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and it occurs to me that I said May 29th as opposed to April 29th, which will make my wife happy because it's our anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. So please join us on April 29th for MASC's Day on the Hill. Thank you very much.